Welcome back. In our last lesson, we were talking about definite integrals. And today we're talking about antiderivatives and indefinite integrals. Just basic rules and notations of those. Our learning objective is to determine antiderivatives of functions and indefinite integrals using the knowledge of derivatives. Example one, state three functions whose derivatives are f of x equals 3x squared. Okay, well, if we just think about that, what function would give you a derivative of 3x squared? What about x to the third plus five? You bring that three forward, yeah? And then it's 3x squared, and then the five just goes away. So yeah, x to the third plus five would work. What about x to the third plus three? Same thing, you'd still get a derivative of three x squared. What about x to the third minus e? If we graph each of these functions, we can see that it's basically the same function just shifted based on these constants here. So as long as that last term is some constant, then the derivatives will all be the same. The graph is just translated up or down by c units. Okay, keep that in mind. A function, big F of x, is an antiderivative of a function, little f of x, if f prime of x equals f of x for all x in the domain of f. <laughs> That's crazy when you read it out loud. The process of finding an antiderivative is anti-differentiation. The family of all antiderivatives of a function is the indefinite integral of f with respect to x and is denoted by that. f of x plus c is called the general solution and c is that constant of integration. Those were all those constants we saw previously. So let's Break this down a little bit. Right here is called the variable of integration. We saw that last lesson. C is the constant of integration. F of x, little f of x is the integrand, and big f of x is the antiderivative. Just like derivatives, there are rules for integration. And you'll find that derivative rules partner with the integration rules. So let's look at a couple of the big ones. The power rule. If you take the derivative of x to the n, do you remember this? The exponent comes forward and then you drop the power by one. The integration rule that goes with that is kind of the opposite. So if you're integrating x to the n, well, this time you're gonna add one to the power and divide by it. And then you always need to remember your constant of integration. So the power rule is add one to the power, divide by the new power. The derivative of a natural log function. If you take the derivative of ln of x, you get one over x. If you take the antiderivative of one over x dx, you get ln of x plus c. Don't forget the plus c. What about trig functions? If you take the derivative of sine x, you get cosine x. What happens if you take the antiderivative of cosine x? You get sine x plus c. <laughs> if you take the derivative of cosine, you get negative sine. If you take the antiderivative of, oh, just sine, what do you get? negative cosine plus c. So let's practice with some of these. We're gonna find the general antiderivative of each of these. So we've got this function 2x and it has a power of one. If I want the antiderivative, I add one to the power, so that's two, and then divide by that number. So two divided by two is one. We now have x squared plus c. And you can always check yourself by 
taking the derivative of the antiderivative. Okay, antiderivative of t squared, we're gonna add one to the power and then divide by the new power. So we get one third t cubed plus c. What about this one, one over x squared? Easiest thing to do here is to rewrite it as a negative exponent and then it's the same thing, add one and divide by it. So negative two plus one is negative one. So we have negative x to the negative one plus c. If you want to leave it like that, you're welcome to. If you want to rewrite it as negative one over x plus c, also fine. Now, before we move on, do you notice that the front of all these has a different notation, g prime of x, f prime of t. This one just says y prime. This one says df, d theta. These are all just saying that these are derivative functions. So if the derivative of a function is cosine theta, the antiderivative is sine theta plus c. Same process, just looks messy with fractions, doesn't it? So if we have a power of 3 fourths, we need to add 4 fourths. That gives us <laughs> 7 fourths that we have to divide by. So 2 thirds divided by 7 fourths or multiply by 4 sevenths, we get 8 over 21, x to the 7 fourths plus c. Oh, F, this is awesome. What is the antiderivative of e to the x? e to the x plus c. When integrating, think before you work. Sometimes you can rewrite problems to fit the integration rules. So for example, this first one, what is one over cosine squared t? Well, that's secant squared. Now I can take the antiderivative of secant squared can you think of a function whose derivative is secant squared? Tangent. So 5e to the t plus tangent t, and of course, plus c. Sometimes you might have to multiply out or distribute through before you can integrate. So then you just take the antiderivative of 9x squared, then the antiderivative of negative 6x, then the antiderivative of 1, and add your plus c. And then if you see something like this, it's nice to separate the fractions. So this could be one problem, x squared over x to the fifth, and four x over x to the fifth is another piece, and five over x to the fifth is another piece, and then rewrite them with negative exponents. And then it's the general power rule of each of these terms separately. Now in the final bit of this lesson, we're actually gonna solve some of these. In other words, we don't wanna end with a plus C. We wanna know what that C actually is. And that's when this initial condition comes in, all right? So F prime of X equals two X minus one. I can rewrite that as dy dx. Those are the same thing. And then, I can take this dx and kind of move it over here. So I get dy equals 2x minus 1 dx. And we're going to talk about this notation and this process in the next chapter, but hey, might as well get used to the notation now. Then we will anti-differentiate both sides. So the antiderivative of dy is y, and then the antiderivative of 2x minus 1, we'll just do each of those separately. You get x squared, that's the antiderivative of 2x, and then minus x, and then our plus c. Okay, now let's look up here to our given condition. We have an x value of 2 and a y value of 5. Well, we can use those in our new equation to solve for c. 5 equals 2 squared minus 2 plus c. So c equals 3. And I can just plug that back into here. And I have my function x squared minus x plus 3. Let's try another one. So we have dy dx equals 2 cosine x. So I'll put the dx over here and keep the dy here. Take the antiderivative of both sides. 
So that would give me 2 sine x plus c. Now we can plug in our initial condition. We have a y of negative 3 and an x of pi over 2. Now we're just solving for c. Sine of pi over 2 is 1, so we get negative 3 equals 2 plus c. c equals negative 5. And our final function is 2 sine x minus 5. g prime of t equals the square root of t. Okay, I don't like those radicals, so I'm going to rewrite that as a fractional exponent. Add 1, divide by it. That's just the general power rule. 2 thirds t to the 3 halves plus c. And then plug in my condition. 6 equals 2 thirds times 9 to the 3 halves plus c. Can you do 9 to the 3 halves in your head? I like to look at the bottom number first. So that's 9 to the 1 half. That's the square root of 9 is 3 cubed is 27. 2 thirds of that is 18. So 6 equals 18 plus c. So c is negative 12. And there we have our function. Let's do another trig function. So the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine plus c. And we'll plug in 2 for y and 0 for theta. Cosine of 0 is uh, 1, so negative 1. Add that to both sides, we get c equals 3. And there's our function. So that's the end of that. I'll see you in the next lesson.